Hello and welcome to the hearing. I'm John. And from Chicago's North Side, I'm Scotto. And before we get to this week's album, um, I skimmed through some of Roxy Music's later albums because you were talking about, you know, how they <laughs> eventually went downhill. Um, it, they were good through the 70s, but as soon as they got to the 80s, they went soft rock. I mean, like, really soft rock, though. On cue, 1980. Um, th- th- that's their last two albums. Um, unfortunately... On their last, on one of their last two albums, 80s Flesh and Blood, they actually do a cover that you might want to check out for the playlist. Oh, yeah? They cover Eight Miles High. Eight Miles High, that's... Um... Birds. Oh. But, the yeah, when you say the playlist, of course, he's speaking of Scotter's uh, playlist of unoriginality mm-hmm. on Spotify. Yes. Link in the description and on this blog. Um but yeah, I mean, it's not good, but it's interesting. You might want to check it out. I, I mean, I tried to go a little bit into the catalog and get into some Brian Eno stuff <laughs> and uh, went and listened to uh, For Your Pleasure, which, it, I mean, the rock parts were good, but there there were like some ballady stuff in there that <laughs> was just kind of like, eh, I'm getting bored of this. And you really only hear Eno's influence on the very last song of the album. Uh-huh. So it's kind of like, well, now I get why he wasn't here for long. Cause yeah. it really, like, what was he doing there? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I skimmed through all of them. They all pretty much sound very similar. They have a very, dis- they have a very consistent sound. 79. They kind of started the slip 80 soft rock yeah and then 82 the uh, avalon the one you were ranting about oh god that's bad <laughs> yeah you know what i've only heard a couple of songs from it but they all just sound like someone that did not have a pulse or someone that was in a coma that made music <laughs> i skimmed the entire album they all sound the same who that's if you've brutal. heard brian uh ferry's solo stuff sounds a lot like that Oh, that's brutal. Yeah. That is really brutal. On to this week's album, which is from 1986, 5150 by Van Halen. This is our Eddie Van Halen tribute episode. Uh, Eddie, Van Halen was an American rock band formed in Pasadena, California in 1974, and best known for launching the career of virtuoso guitarist Eddie Van Halen, who proceeded to forever change how guitarists think of the instrument as well as their string of controversial lead vocalists, David Lee Roth, Sammy Hagar, David Sh- Dave, uh, Gary Sharon, and David Lee Roth again, and for their long list of hits during the 80s, and for three or four years, depending on how you, and through the 80s and 90s, and, and for, you know, some of the late 90s and 2000s, depending on how you look at it, they basically were active up until 95, did one in like 98 and 90, 98, 99, and then one in 2012. Yeah, I was going to say that was the final. Yeah. I, I, I was just like a... Tripped yeah. over my wording there. I don't even think I've heard the the album from 2012, actually. I, I skimmed I it. I was tell you, I couldn't tell you a single song from that album. Yeah. Like, it was never played anywhere. Bunch of aging rock stars trying to relive their youth. Yeah. Pretty much. Well... I think really what it was, from what I understand, was he wanted to do something with his son. Well, yeah, I've read up on that. Uh, Wolfgang Van Halen, Eddie's son, found some old tapes that he had done demos and stuff he was writing and asked, wanted to kind of develop those in, that into new material. And they started working on that. And then they realized this isn't going to be a new album. And then they got in touch with Roth. Um, and Anthony, Michael Anthony already left by that point. Um, so, you know, Wolfgang came in on bass. And it I thought they booted the Anthony, album. actually. Hmm? <laughs> I thought they booted Anthony. I, I can't find anything specific about that, but I get the impression, and I, this is going to be later, but, um, the only person I've ever heard badmouth Sammy Hagar is Eddie Van Halen. <laughs> and Sammy Hagar is bad mouth Eddie Van Halen. Yeah, uh, I think there was I, possibly I think, a part, power struggle going on there, and and part of it was that that you know they booted Anthony 
out of there. But really, it was just they're going to get back together, but he only wanted to do it with the son, you know? Right. Um, but um, Michael Anthony has done two projects with Hagar since he left. Yeah. So I think one of them was, I think their firings were connected because they got along. You know, Anthony, Michael Anthony and Sammy Hagar got along, and Van Halen didn't want anything to do with either of them. Yeah, it's a it's a pretty weird dynamic that I don't know. Yeah. Nobody really comes out and says what happened no. exactly. No. You just get these. Oh, there were some crazy things that happened. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and like, particularly okay when Eddie Van Halen has talked about has said that you know, Michael Anthony can't play bass and he had to actually teach him the bass lines. Michael Anthony's parts aren't complicated, but he's a damn good bass player. <laughs> right. And, he's I mean, damn solid. Some, the, you know, there are parts where you're kind of like, did they just do like a, a sequence in this album? <laughs> or is it actually Michael Anthony playing that? Anthony, he, he was in school studying jazz bass when he joined the band. <laughs> he's a damn solid player. He, did, he wasn't real showy. But he is a damn solid player. My, Eddie Van Halen did not have to teach him the parts. Like he may have <laughs> written the bass parts, he wrote all the music, but he didn't have to teach him to play it. <laughs> anyway, Fifty One Fifty is the band's seventh studio album. It marks uh, Sammy Hagar's debut with the band, and it's named after Eddie Van Halen's home studio, Fifty One Fifty, which in turn is named after the California California law enforcement term for a mentally disturbed person. A reference to Section 5150 of the California Welfare and Institutions Code. The album was released on March 24th, 86, on Warner Brothers, produced by Mick Jones, the one from Farner, Don Landy, and Van Allen, and features Sammy Hagar on lead and backing vocals, Eddie Van Halen on guitar, keyboards, and backing vocals, Michael Anthony on bass and backing vocals, and Alex Van Halen on drums. Reminder, I don't edit any songs into our reviews for copyright reasons, but down in the description, if you're watching this on YouTube, or listening to this on YouTube, we don't do video anymore. Or if you're listening to this on our you know, the the podcast version, you can find it at johnandscotto.com. Uh, that is links to 5150 on Spotify and YouTube, so you can follow along if you'd like. On to track one, Good Enough. Nice big bopper reference at the top of this one. <laughs> you know, I, of course, back in the day, I had no idea that was a big bopper reference. Mm-hmm. When I learned that it was a big bopper reference years later, I don't think I ever got why there's a big bopper reference there. I mean, it is Hagar introducing himself to the Van Halen fan base. Mm -hmm. But other than that, what does Hagar have in common with the big bopper? Well, it's it's the song Chantilly Lace by Big Bopper. It starts with him saying, hello, baby, in a very distinct way. And Hagar impersonates that at the beginning of the song i think it was just his way of saying hello to the fans <laughs> like i'm the new singer hello i'm here they are very conscious of that they, there's like a few you know mm-hmm. references in the album of like you know especially the last track the last track is entirely about that yeah um this one i don't really have a lot to say it's just kind of your boilerplate van halen song <laughs> Um, but I will listen to the lyrics as an adult. Mm-hmm. I mean, of course, it's just all these innuendos stacked on top of yeah, each yeah, other. Yeah. However, is it really all that flattering and convincing to just say that she's good enough? <laughs> <laughs> That's a fair point. I mean, I, you know, I think maybe he's doing the whole good enough to eat you know kind yeah, of that's, thing that's the implication she's not it, he doesn't say she's good enough for me i think maybe he says that at the end but he's good enough she's good enough to dot 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 well they never complete the sentence yeah it's always good enough to and i mean sometimes mm-hmm. there's uh you know so yeah. like different sound effects right. he uses or he just screams at mm-hmm. the end but yeah they, you never say good enough to what yeah which to me suggests that he's really saying good enough to fuck yeah, which, basically. which is that really all that flattering right right it's not good but you know what she's good enough <laughs> but i don't have much to say about the song specifically so i will take the opportunity to talk about eddie a little um okay. the brown sound will never be replicated and by brown sound i don't mean the south park thing that's what I thought you were going with. I don't re- didn't realize they could make you shit. No. Um, <laughs> Eddie called his tone the brown tone. The brown sound. 
That's what he called his rig and how he set his specific tone. Nobody okay. else sounds like that. Um, well, yeah, the the beat is a very Van Halen beat. <laughs> mm -hmm. And his riffs were very, were in a lot of songs, very close to the vocal ones. Yeah. Which I think made them, they, which is, I think, why they were so commercial. Like, they were, they had a great pop sense. And they were very distinctive in that way. Um, and, you know, people talk about the tapping because that's what he was known for. But it wasn't just the tapping that he revolutionized. He changed guitar playing. He invented shred guitar. Right. The that, way he that used the tremolo. You the... you know, that's, that's a much better way of putting it when people try to, to say he invented tapping, which no. is He never claimed absurd. it. I sent <laughs> right. you a few videos about tapping. Yes. Did you watch them? I, I saw that. Like, uh, yeah, the one that went back to the 30s was... Mm -hmm. that, that was just mind-blowing. The ukulele there. player named Royce Mech was tapping on a ukulele in the 30s. It goes back to flamenco guitar a little before then. There was a guy named Jimmy Webster in the 40s who was tapping on an electric guitar, kind of doing a Stanley Jordan thing. Stanley Jordan's a jazz player. Kind of that along the same... Video, the video, the shocking thing was they didn't mention Django Reinhardt, who I think was definitely I don't know tapping tap. up to Storm. Uh, I mean... Okay. He kind of had to make up because I think he lost a few fingers. Well, he lost, yeah, he had like two or three fingers on his left hand. Yeah. <laughs> it's the mother of invention. Like mm -hmm. Steve Hackett started tapping because, my God, this keyboard player I'm in a band with is fucking fast as hell oh. and they want me to play in unison with them. <laughs> How Actually, am I going to keep up with them? Hacky, I'm glad you brought up Hackett because one video didn't mention Hackett, another one right, did. Right, the same video also didn't mention Hackett. It was kind of like, what? <laughs> Hackett started tapping because he was trying to learn to cut in fugue in D minor. Yeah. And it was the only, coincidentally, because that's their theme music for Zombie Tega. Um, <laughs> yes. You just, just you steal drums. That's what works for us. Um, but he, there was the only way he could pull off part of Takata was to tap. Um, but Hackett claims that Van Halen credits him as an influence. I found no other source saying that Eddie ever claimed hack it as an influence well the story i'd heard and i, I, I heard for a different, few different sources so i can't give specific credit mm -hmm. but eddie wanted to originally name the band genesis they were originally called genesis yes they changed and it in 73 ish because he, they found out about the english genesis right so he's in this record store by them in pasadena i think and uh they're like fuck there's another band with that name mm -hmm. and so they also he he picked he bought the album, uh -huh. and it was nursery crime, uh -huh. and you know Hackett taps up a, a pretty good storm there. But of course, how would you know he was tapping yeah. just by listening to no, it? You wouldn't if you didn't know the technique. Right. No, the story... it wasn't until he saw, and you're, I think you're about to tell, say who the story he Eddie tells, and I've been hearing this story since the eighties. Um. He, as a kid, grew up, growing up in L.A. after they moved from um, um, the Netherlands. I, I think Netherlands or Denmark. I don't remember exactly. Netherlands. Um, was he would go to every show at the Forum that he had any interest in. He went to see Zeppelin. And if you've ever seen any clips of Zeppelin live during Whole Lot of Love, in, this, in the solo, Paige does this thing where he holds his Les Paul up to the left and, you know, hammers on with his left hand, holds yeah. his right hand up in the air. It's just a little showman thing. Eddie saw this and thought, okay, if I bar my, if I bar the strings with my right hand, you know, kind of like a capo, I can bring the left, both hands up and play that anywhere on the neck. And then suddenly realize, wait, why am I crossing hands? If I just keep the left hand low, I can play with tap with the right hand. I can push the strings down with the right hand. Now and, Hackett was doing two hand tapping, you know, too. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if he actually saw Hackett play. That I don't way. think so, because yeah, I mean, um, that was seventy four that he seventy three ish that he discovered Genesis, and the first Van Halen album was seventy eight. I think he probably had it together before then. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've heard the Page story multiple times. Also, Van Halen um, competed in piano competitions as a kid won several of them and 
that was also the idea of okay, press the thing down to get this get to get the note. Yeah. Um, Stanley Jordan, another great tapper, started off as a piano player. His whole style, he plays chords and bass lines with his left and melody with his right on a guitar. Um, his whole idea was to, to try to maximize the potential of a guitar like a piano. Um, so they both kind of came from that piano side. Um, so I don't really buy that he was super influenced by Hackett. Um, I mean, Hackett has a notoriously massive ego. But, I mean, he had nursery crime in 74. Yeah. So and... there may have been a little bit. I mean... That that is a there's a lot of tapping on that yeah. <laughs> yeah, Return of the Giant Hogweed. Yeah. Uh even part of the musical box and then uh Fountain of Samasis. There may have been a little bit of influence, but by and large, Van Halen's influences were Page and Clapton. He was very bluesy. So there wasn't a lot of hackett in there. He was a big fan of Genesis though. Okay, I didn't he did end up becoming a big Genesis fan. In okay. fact, part of Mike Rutherford's biography, very interesting, before they did this album, and when be, around the same time Rutherford was looking to do oh, a side project from the band, mm -hmm. uh, Eddie invited Rutherford out to California to collaborate together. Oh, wow. Okay. And so he comes out to the studio. They uh, he, he gets ready to work with them. Rutherford's kind of a, you know, up and at him, get let's get to it kind of thing. Uh, where Eddie is kind of show up at the studio around four in the afternoon is mm -hmm. how he stated it. Mm -hmm. And so after a few days of them not really seeing each other, they, they, they just didn't. Uh, mm -hmm. He just yeah. left. Well, but that could have been instead of Mike and the mechanics. Yeah, yeah. Could have been a collaration between Rutherford and Van Halen. And, uh, and you listen put... to this album and you hear uh, like an 80s Genesis on this album. Yeah, yeah, there is. Um, but, you know, that would have put Rutherford back on bass where he belongs and yes. had Van Halen playing guitar. Speaking I think of... that was the point. <laughs> yeah. Um, just to finish the, the, the proper tribute portion here. 80s metal guitar existed because of van halen oh definitely that whole style came from eddie nobody played like that tapping aside the, the shredding the whammy bar the whole nine eddie invented all of that right that so, that is the best way of putting it rather than putting in tapping saying that he invented shredding yeah. is is the best and i haven't heard anybody say it that way actually he is on the short list of the greatest most influential guitarists of all time it's charlie christian the first lead guitarist in a jazz band les paul enough, enough said if you know anything about yeah. les paul Jimi hendrix and eddie van halen yeah. those four changed the instrument and maybe there are has been someone since then but i haven't heard about it but i am a bit too old to know <laughs> So, you know, that is why he is one of the greats of all time. Not just because of the tapping. Yeah, he, others had done it. He maybe borrowed from Hackett. He borrowed from Page. But he also put his own spin on it. He did it differently than they did. Because Hackett's tapping does not sound saw, like Van Halen's tapping. As soon as he saw what Page was doing, my mm. guess is that clicked. Yeah. Oh, that's what Hackett is doing Maybe. on those records. <laughs> but then Van Halen kind of went classical with it. Yeah. And took his own took it in its own direction and he popularized it. <laughs> you know. Even if, if he had never done it, nobody else would have because yeah, Hackett was ahead of him, but honestly, who was Hackett influencing outside of a handful of prog players? Right. It's he's a very, you know <laughs> Hackett's a brilliant player, but his reach is pretty small. <laughs> Right. So, anyway, with all that said, on to track two. The, the first big single, Why Can't This Be Love? Love how the synth blends with the guitar on this one. Had anyone used this guitar sound? Um, well... You mean the synthesizer I, or the guitar? Th this guitar sound... It's kind of a synth guitar kind of thing that he's using, isn't well, it? That's just... There's a synth and a guitar. The guitar is pretty clearly a guitar. The synth is kind of dirty and distorted sounding. Like he's like Gilmore used this on animals. 
And of course, Frampton used it on Frampton Comes mm-hmm. Alive. And it kind of disappeared, I think, because I can't think of any in the 80s. No. A- anyone using until this. Until this came along. Until this. And then, of course, after this, you get Bon Jovi and Motley Crue and even No Doubt and I'm Just a Girl. Yeah, actually. And li- you, with Bon Jovi, you're thinking Living on a Prayer? Uh, yes, yes. That's a, that's a talk box. That's Which is not what which this is. Rampant. This isn't a talk box. It has really? a similar sound to a talk box. Um, yeah. The guitar riff on Just a Girl is about the closest, but that's a guitar. This is actually a keyboard. Um, it's got a lot of chorus, and you can actually, you throw enough chorus on a bass, you can get the same sound. Um, <laughs> found that out back in the day. <laughs> um, but this one, I actually like this one, I think, the most of any of the singles. A great groove, really nice harmonies. I gotta give Sammy a little love because I love his phrasing and his emotional intensity. His voice goes through a lot of different changes on this album. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he's trying to play all the parts here, mm-hmm. and yeah, this is probably the one where where they do it best. I would say the pop side. Yeah, yeah. Um, love the scatting part before the solo. Um, Eddie's playing this part, and Sammy's singing to it. I love that part too. Yeah, Hagar and and. And Van Halen duetting pretty much. And then there's like a chord solo, which is a fascinating choice for, you know, <laughs> this shredder. Really simple chord solo. <laughs> On to track three, Get Up. This is my favorite. It's just, it's almost punk. It's probably the heaviest Van Halen song. Or at least the heaviest I've heard. At least on this album, at least. It is. I, I, of all of their stuff, I think this is one of their fastest songs. Um Love the soul, love the guitar tone, this kind of slidey off kilter riff between the verses. It's just very motivating. Um, love the hot, that high harmonic thing before the chorus, the pre chorus, um, or in the pre chorus. And there's this very quick change to this finger picked part before the solo, <laughs> which is another thing he did a lot was he would finger pick with, an, with a much cleaner tone in the middle of a heavy song. <laughs> Um, I love how he just threw that in occasionally. Although, and I kind of feel like it's difficult for us to review a Van Halen album. Because so. our our generation particularly, we're just inundated with Van Halen. Right. And, that, and of course, we should have explained up front, we know this is kind of a, a dumb yeah. way to tribute. Well, you, you wanted to review a Van Hagar record, so you explain it. Yeah. So I've heard a lot of tributes to Eddie Van Halen, and a lot of them were pretty fucking terrible, honestly. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of them reviewed just the first album and just they stayed on the first album. Right. I'm thinking maybe we should have done Diver Down. I don't know. Uh, but... <laughs> I was thinking I wouldn't have done the first one, even as great as it is. I probably would have gone with Diver Down or Women Your Children first. And, uh, but yeah, a lot of the reviews tended to have been more about David Lee Roth in right. some cases than they were about Eddie Van Halen. Uh-huh. So we wanted to do something where we were just focused on eddie for the most part right. here i mean i gotta love, give sammy and alex a little credit here and there but it's mostly gonna be that eddie right but between 84 and 95 when they released balance we were just drenched in van halen yeah so i was it's... pretty done when when fuck came out <laughs> yeah same that and was pretty so, much my although, uh, done. I, I still love right now as overplayed as it was, I still love oh, right really? now. <laughs> um, but so it's difficult to look at their music objectively when you've heard so damn much of it. Yeah. You know, um, but it, it was and an interesting one to go me, back to. Hmm? It grow, this album for me, actually growing up, this, this was <laughs> a pretty like repeated album mm-hmm. when I was a kid. Yeah. yeah. That, more so than the other ones even. Um, and it's interesting. I'm only a year and a half older, but Jump and the the, the 1984 stuff was a little more intense. Was more, you know, overplayed for me. Jump and I'll wait. Oh, very much so. Yeah, yeah. Um, this one came along, and I think it was a relief for me because it wasn't Jump. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. We wanted to move on from that because I really liked this one back in the day. Um, yeah. Same here. 
onto track four, Dreams. Um, this one's a big left turn from um, Get Up. <laughs> it's kind of the first poppy ballad. Uh, you know, Why Can't This Be Love is kind of... Well, I guess that's not a poppy ballad. No, it's more of a rock song. It's the first one with synthesizers on the album, but it's, yeah. it's a noticeable synth. But it's more of a rock song. This is that, that poppy ballad. Um, not sure how I feel about them kind of going back and forth like that on the record. Right. I think he should have started another band, honestly. You know, he should have done two bands. Mm -hmm. One for pop and one for metal. Well, from what I recall, well, they were never really metal. They were hard rock, but... Okay, yeah, hard rock, whatever. Um, From what I recall, Roth left because Van Halen wanted to go into a more keyboard-heavy pop direction. Yeah. You know, he wanted to stay with the hard... Roth wanted to keep it hard rock. Uh, Eddie wanted to bring in the keyboards, and, and so that's why broth split um i just thought they couldn't stand each other no i mean <laughs> you what i found interesting you know hearing a lot of people who've who met him over the years talk about him they were all very nice because he's gone but none of the story all of the stories line up with what i've heard is, which is over the you know since the 80s which is that he wasn't like a bad person but he he's kind of a notorious prick he had a gigantic ego <laughs> Which one? Uh, Van Reddy. Because, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, you kind of wonder about both of them. Well, no, Eddie was kind of a dick, from what I've heard. Yeah. Um, I don't, I never met him, I have no idea, but that's what I've always heard, like, going back to the 80s. Um, and he just kind of didn't give a shit about a lot of things. Um, Roth did, did has... you hear David Lee Roth's radio show? Oh, yeah, Roth has a massive ego. He's a singer. Oh, it goes beyond that. If you listen to that radio show that only lasted about three weeks when they tried to replace Howard Stern with them, Mm -hmm. uh, following a train of thought was just like, what? Oh, yeah, yeah. He rambles. (laughs) He was Um, was nuts. Yeah. um, And that's why they had to give him the hook. uh You know, so it's like, yeah, there's stuff on both sides. I I get it. Oh, yeah, of course. Oh, yeah, I don't think either side is innocent. I mean, even Sammy, I was kind of nice to Sammy earlier. I'm sure he was, you know, hard to deal with in his own way. Yeah. He's a singer. Every yes. singer has a massive ego. You need that to do the job. <laughs> so if you're a lead singer. If you're a lead singer in a band, you have to have a big ego to stand out there and, and be the focal point. How did they do play Dreams live, though? Because yeah, it, like, it sounds like Eddie is playing three different instruments here. <laughs> On the verses, he played guitar. On the chorus, he went over to the keyboard. The intro to the song, he's playing the guitar and the keys. Well, there's some acoustic guitar in the intro, yeah. Right. Um, and then it, it, the riff comes in and there's some rhythm, electric rhythm. They just kind of ignored all that live. Um, they, they just, did they not do the keyboards live? Or? No, he, he played the keyboards of the intro. And then okay. it got to the verse, he went, oh, he walked out with the guitar. He, he switched yeah. the guitar. And then he went back to the keyboard for the chorus. Um, there's a concert that got played on MTV a lot back in the day, live without a net. Um, I uh, post- yeah, I remember that. I posted a clip uh, from it for this week's video. Um, I would recommend checking that out if you can find it, um, if you really want to know how they pulled this stuff off live. But yeah, they didn't overdub or, or didn't track anything. It was just they, they would cut the guitar part or the keyboard part, whichever was less necessary at the time. <laughs> But I do like the piano riff in this one. It, it's kind of infectious. Um, good groove in the verse. Love Sammy's vocal in this one, um, particularly in the verse. Um, and love how the kicks hit in the slow part of the chorus. That that you know the part. There's almost no drums except for these really huge kicks. Um, yeah. Alex's kick drums were huge. Um, right, I mean, you know, I, I wanted to bring that up actually for um, good enough. Like he starts mm-hmm. doing like these. At first, I thought they were fills, but towards the end of that one, but those are just kicks. Yeah, oh, everybody talks about Dave Lombardo for the double kick rolls, but Alex Van Halen was first. <laughs> really? The first layer, yeah. Huh. You know, he was doing this in '84 with Thought for Teacher. I thought that was just a drum machine, but yeah, I guess you're right. Hopper Teacher was drums. He plays that shit live, or at least yeah. back in the day, he played that shit live perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they did not use drum machines. Um, 
So and you remember the the video for Dreams was just this like weird blue angels, mm-hmm. yeah, <laughs> like B roll or whatever, you know. Oh, it was that, kind of strange. That is not the beginning of the weirdness for this album. We have yet to get to Love Walks In. <laughs> but back to Dreams, one last thing. I love how heavy it gets right before the solo. It just finally this pretty piano battle just gets loud suddenly. Love that. Um, on to track five, Summer Nights. Love the sort of bouncing, finger-picked riff at the beginning. And it's, it's one of those songs that I didn't remember until I heard the opening guitar riff. This, as a kid, this was my favorite song mm. on the album. Um, it was just, you know, before you're going out, you yeah. know, it, it literally, mm. it, it it's on the nose, yeah. but it... it nails it and the if feel this of the song now, it would be a country song yeah true but the feel of the song fits the topic perfectly it does it you does know, they it's... really captured it um love how the bass jumps out a bit more on this one um great groove um the guitar kind of sounds smaller on this one it's just one instead of being these layered guitars on both sides there's just one guitar kind of small on the left side just fitting in with the band which is a nice touch it might be his best riff on the album, actually. Yeah, I, one of them. Um, I think. I mean, as far as riffs go, I think. Yeah. Um, another great riff during the solo. The lead guitar does get a little overpowering, and it's a little overprocessed. <laughs> you know, it's this nice. You just get one guitar on the left, kind of fitting in with the band. It's just kind of fun. The solo comes in. It just gets kind of overwhelming there, but. Um, well, and it's weird too because the breakdown before the solo is like this show tunish kind of shuffle, mm-hmm. you know, kind of yeah. thing, and then he just comes out with the solo that's uh... yeah, kind of takes <laughs> your head off. Seems... Yeah, and this is the point where I noticed I'm really enjoying all the songs that weren't singles. <laughs> well, my scorecard here has uh, three traditional Van Halen songs that mm-hmm. that Roth could have sang on. Yeah. versus two pop songs. Right. Uh, on to track six, Best, best of Both Worlds. Great, another great finger-picked riff. Nice to That's hear a, a very fairly AC clear DC tone. riff. Yeah, it is, now that you mention it. Um, nice to hear a fairly clean guitar on a Van Halen record. Um, <laughs> love the way the bass is kind of just ahead of the kick. And Alex played as ahead of the beat, but Michael Anthony was just a little ahead of him. That was interesting. Great tone on the solo. Um, love the way the clean finger pick riff contrasted afterwards and the oh, last yeah. verse. I love how it becomes an acoustic version mm-hmm. of that riff. Yeah. And then Later I love on. the last verse. You don't have to die and go to heaven or hang or, or stick around to be born again. Just tune into what the play, this place has got to offer because we might never be here again. Only lyric I'm going to quote. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they never really credit who wrote what exactly i think um, generally speaking Ed, eddie wrote the music and the singer whoever that was at the time wrote the lyrics yeah and probably the vocal melody it's the way Wait, a lot of bands work um, but they got they all got the writing credit though i think well, yeah. they all went to van halen so well, they were all you share the writing credit so everybody gets a cut of the ascap money or bmi that's money. true that's true you know um because that, that way there are no fights and no, no issues. <laughs> Everybody gets a cut. Everybody's happy. Um, on to track seven, Love Walks In. <laughs> I really didn't know what I was going to pick for my weakest on this until this <laughs> song started. This uh, this could have, if this were on a Mike and the Mechanics album, it <laughs> yeah. probably would have been one of the weaker tracks on the Mike yeah. and the Mechanics album. Um, there's a YouTuber who goes by Professor of Rock, who I watch, um, talks about 80s music a lot. He did, had a short interview with uh, Sammy Hagar. They talked about this song. Sammy said it wasn't a single. Professor of Rock corrects him, says yeah, it was a single. Oh, right. It, I meant, if Sammy says, I, I meant it, was, it wasn't a big single. <laughs> <laughs> it's just soft rock. The vocals don't elevate it, which is a horrible thing to say about Sammy. The solo <laughs> doesn't elevate it. And Eddie Van Halen solo does not elevate the song. The, it's... It's embarrassing, honestly. The slow poppy chorus is just cringy. I 
recently, this past weekend, I bought a, a MIDI keyboard, a computer, a, a music keyboard, a synthesizer. Um, because after the Freeze Pop album, I've been dabbling a lot more with synthesizers, and it was yeah. just time to finally really learn to play. This song almost made me regret that choice. <laughs> But there is one interesting thing about this song. The I lyrics. I like the bass line. Hmm? I like the bass line. Okay. Two. But the lyrics? <laughs> it's about aliens. Is it really about aliens, though? Sammy has said himself, it's about aliens. He, <laughs> he claims that since the 70s, I want to say, he has had off and on contact with aliens. It's been telepathic. One night... He woke up and his room was awash in, you know, bright light. And he, you know, heard them doing something in his head and they suddenly disconnected. And he claims that they have telepathically communicated with him off and on over the years. I, that, I don't, I mean, you know what? I've heard him say it's about aliens and, you know, they have the some kind of alien and stuff. But let's be honest. This is an attempt of... Uh, a blatant conscious attempt at making a prom song or a wedding song. <laughs> and... I think it's a combination of the two, because there are definitely parts of that that are that, definitely. Um, I like, think actually, they combined like, that the with his, his end, weird alien like, ideas. The the dress and satin yeah, kind yeah, yeah. of thing. I, I mean... It, I, uh, I see like, where you're going, I definitely. caught that on the second listen and was just like, Fuck. This. That line stood out to me back in the day because it makes no sense in context. Because most of the song is about contact with aliens, and then you bring this this love story in that that's completely out of context. I think that part was meant to be the prom song, but the rest yeah. was just Sammy's weird ass ideas about aliens. But that that's what this was gunning for. This was gunning to Musically, be... Musically, it certainly is that. The prom song or the wedding song, that's what they wanted because that makes a lot of money in the end. But if you listen to the rest of the verses, it's not. it has nothing to do with that. Ah, he, he's trying to put in the context of a relationship and everything. Uh, yes, he's trying to say that, well, it could be about a relationship with aliens, but no <laughs> uh, i i buy the alien thing i think they just crammed the love story the love song stuff in to I make it more marketable love to buy the story of the alien but i i seriously doubt that this is about an alien i think it was the same face of hey, hey yeah we uh you know tried to write wonderful tonight <laughs> the 80s version of that <laughs> On to track eight, the title track, 5150. This was one I'd forgotten about mm -hmm. until the opening 30 seconds and it brought yeah, it all back. Same. Um, love the opening section. It's just Eddie going off for a couple of minutes um, on this really nice riff. Very 80s. Love it. Love all the Rototom fills. Not sure how I feel about the riff going into the verses. It's a... <laughs> I initially had that it's a, a variant on the Hoochie Coochie Man riff yeah. until early, earlier, bad to the bone riff if you're younger or if you don't know the blues. Um, earlier today, I realized, no, it's a variant on Whole Lot of Love. I was going to say you didn't see, the, or if you didn't see the movie Get Crazy. Okay. <laughs> Remember they it, all did the Hoochie Coochie. Yeah. <laughs> it's Eddie's version of Whole Lot of Love, which in and of itself yes. is a variant of the whole of Hoochie Coochie. Um, he does a very, you know, Robert Plant impression. Sammy does, yeah. Um, yes. Sammy's always kind of doing a Plant impression. Um, love the off time bit right before the chorus. Love how sparse the beginning of the solo is. Just gives a great sense of anticipation. Eddie just plays a couple of notes here and there. Doesn't really go off for like the first half of the solo. The end of the solo is very Page. Again, he quotes Page. Yeah. I think he actually quoted a Zeppelin solo. I just don't remember which one. So shouldn't you have Paige in your, your pantheon of like guitarists uh, and what no, they no. did for the guitar? Paige is a brilliant player, one of the most influential. He didn't really change how it's played, though, how it's approached. Not the way Eddie did. Not the way the others did. I mean, the whole, you know, the stick and everything. and just you know, The violin the bow. bow 
was is a nod to him that someone does once in a while. <laughs> you know, but it's an obvious nod to to Page. Um, it's not like he invent he didn't invent anything. <laughs> he was he's a brilliant player, incredibly influential, one of my biggest influences. But no, he's not on that level. Um, he's up there with picked... Clapton and Beck as like super influential, but they didn't change the way anybody approached the instrument. Hmm. Um, final track, Inside. So I'd have to pick 5150 as my pick for strongest. Oh, I'm sorry. Song. Okay. Sorry, I which stepped is, over that. Which is funny because it's right after the weakest track yeah. Love Walks mm-hmm. In. <laughs> and, we... and to have that as the weakest track when you have the last track on here. <laughs> I kind of love this one. Track nine, Inside. Love the distortion on the bass. The lyrics are basically... It just starts off with the band talking. Do yes. You, and they're kind of mocking all the criticisms and all of the shit that they got because of Sammy and because of D.O.R. leaving. It's very Dark Side of the Moon, actually. Yeah, yeah. Because it's these conversations going on mm-hmm. throughout the song. It's a good groove, though, and a good chorus. Oh, yeah, great groove, great chorus. Although the way, the way it first comes in, it's a little loungy. <laughs> Yeah, yes. It doesn't sound loungy later, but the first time they sing it, because they're really singing it, and yeah. it sounds a bit loungy. Love the vocal. This is an overused expression, but but yeah, Sammy goes to church on this one. <laughs> he really goes off on this one. Um, right, it kind of it builds like they when they like you said when it first comes up the chorus, it's loungy, mm-hmm. but then it gets gains an in intensity by yeah. the end. Um, and Eddie's going off just as much. And I love that that dialogue between the band is in the background the whole time. Yes. It's just this you know, five minute conversation that they all had just, you know, fucking around in the studio, joking around that they've recorded and just stuck behind the entire song. <laughs> I would love to know what they were saying for most of it. Yeah, you catch bits and pieces yeah. here, you know. You get a line here and there, but most of it's pretty inaudible. Um, so you know, my you have to talk to my accountant. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Which has to be a dig at somebody. Yeah, yeah. Of course, it's all digs. It's all yeah. them, and even Sammy's lyrics. This the sun lyrics are references to the shit they got when DLR left and Sammy joined. <laughs> they're they're taking the piss out of all of it. Um, only criticism: guitar might be panned a little too far right for my tastes. Um, Love the line, I came to this thing with an open mind. I came to this thing at my own expense. <laughs> there were a few uh, vocalists that were batted around um, mm-hmm. uh, before Ed, uh, Sammy was mm-hmm. picked on. I don't know if you saw any of that. No, I hadn't actually heard about that. UltimateClassicRock.com. Uh, they, one of them was Steve Perry. Oh, because God. he... He was having a fallout with falling mm-hmm. out with Journey at the time, and uh, I don't think he really took them seriously. This Perry, I think he was yeah. like, "Really, you're gonna, you're getting me." Mm-hmm. Uh, the other one was Patty Smith of Scandal. Um, now who, that could have worked. The only problem, she was far along in her pregnancy. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> Vocally, she could have worked. A woman fronting Van Halen would never have gone over. They uh, and they actually after Hagar split, they tried. They they did want uh, Sass Jordan. Huh. Uh, they and who said reportedly said it was the dumbest idea she'd ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> A woman see for Van Halen. Yeah, that would never have flawed. Um, Cause especially after Hagar, because a lot of this is just testosterone, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. lyrics. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, Patty Smith. Um, Patty Smith's voice, Smith. Sp- Smite. Scandal, yeah, not Smith. yeah. Um, her voice would have fit. Steve Perry, one of the greatest vocalists of all time, love his voice. It would not have worked in Van Halen. Well, they also had suggested the idea of doing Mike and the Mechanics pretty much and having multiple Different vocalists. Yeah, yeah. Because um, that first Mechanics album isn't just Paul Carrick and Paul Young. Oh. Uh, it, there, there's like two other singers who I can't honestly for the life of me okay. can't even remember their names. Hmm, he just that. settled with Paul Young and Paul mm-hmm. Carrick. Right. 
um, <laughs> that's another great part of his biography because yeah. apparently Paul Young was a big cokehead and uh, mm -hmm. was kind of like a someone let the crack in out of the hotel room kind of thing. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they were thinking about that with the last album, a different kind of trust, I think it's called. Before DLR came back, they were going to get a variety of different singers. Um, those ideas never really worked. The only one I think who actually tried it was Talking Heads after Burn left, and That's that album went nowhere. Really. Yeah, I mean there were some great songs on that album, but mm -hmm. there were some that just did not work. Um, they they had somebody uh, named Mitch Malloy, who I'm not even sure what band he's from. Name rings a bell. After Hagar left, and it was really serious. They'd written something together, but that they went and did the thing with David Lee Roth. Well, no. Like the, the weird appearance with him uh -huh. in like at the like the VMAs, and he was just kind of like, "Well, fuck this! If you're gonna go back with him," and he left. Uh. Oh, <laughs> that, and then Sharon. Uh, they also before Sharon were talking to Sebastian Bach. That makes sense. That would have been yeah, interesting. That um, would have been interesting too. That probably would have made more sense. Yeah. Than Sharon. Which... Oh, Sharon! I skimmed that album the other day. I was underwhelmed by the single. I skimmed the album. I'm still underwhelmed. Um, I don't even think I can remember the single off that one. He just didn't fit. And it was also the way he was singing. Because Sharon's got a hell of a voice. Right. And but it's the not stuff for this. he did with Extreme, there was a lot of variety in his voice. Right. When he, he belted and kind of screamed the heavy stuff. He had a softer, kind of more mellow side. On the Van Halen record, if you've heard Without You, the single... He sang the entire thing like that. He was just shouting. <laughs> Barely in key. Didn't make sense. Um, different kind of trust. I heard a few songs off of it. The last one with Roth. It's okay. It's just old guys trying to relive their youth. <laughs> Fueled by one, the son of one of them on bass. Yeah. Um, I hope he doesn't try to ride this. If he, try, if he, if he stays in music, Wolfgang. I hope he's just, in his next band, he's just the bass player and doesn't draw attention to his last name. Uh, from what I understand, he is has been working on a solo project okay. and, he's, and he's not giving it up. So he was kind of pissed that people had spread rumors about him okay. taking the lead guitar well, and pretty also, much said that that was bullshit. Yeah, yeah, I saw, I heard about that. He played bass on the last record, not guitar. Um, right. I don't even know if he plays guitar. I mean, if he plays bass, he probably plays some guitar. But I think his... on his solo project, he plays multiple instruments. Okay. Uh, I mean, you, you know, obviously he doesn't want to replace his father because it's his father. But also, no guitar Who would player... would want to replace that? No guitar player in their right mind would want to step into that. Right. That's insane. So, like, the idea that there is going to be another Van Halen record is absurd. Roth needs to... Roth needs to go into radio. Because that's where he fucking belongs. <laughs> if they did another Van Halen anything, you would have to have multiple guitarists. Yeah, and to even replace then, any. nobody is playing guitar on a Van Halen record. No guitar like, player wants to do that. <laughs> I, well, if they did like a tour, you know, yeah. you would need multiple leads. It's kind of like when Genesis tribute bands do well, Tony Banks right. part. It's multiple guys. Right. I mean, unless it's a tribute thing where, you know, then they play like the classics and everybody takes their stab at it. That gets it. That I could say. See you doing See happening. But if Van Halen went forward, nobody would want that, that job. No. Roth needs to do radio because that's where he belongs. Um, like I said, um, Wolfgang, okay, he's doing a solo thing. I think he'd be, I think his career is better off if he just kind of blends into a band. As yes. the bass player and doesn't draw attention to his last name. Right. Alex needs to semi-retire, do clinics a few times a year. <laughs> you know, um, that's about it. Uh, maybe some session work. That's a, a, now and then. But yeah, let the band go. And I think they will. They, ha they yeah. have to. Anyway, do you recommend it? Oh, man. Um I've been on the fence for a while with this because mm -hmm. it's such a nostalgic album. But, uh, I mean, half of it's really good when they're doing the Van Halen for right. the most part. But there's a lot of just pretty bad pop, so I'd have yeah. to say no. <laughs> no. Um, 
Uh, I have kind of a, I, I have a cop out answer. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I don't think most, some of half of this will apply to our audience because I think most of our audience is about our age. But if you are younger, if you're Gen Z, young millennial, not really familiar with Van Halen, because I'm pretty sure no one under 30 knows Van Halen. You know, the concept of this album didn't even make any sense either. Calling was, it 5150. Well, they just named it after a studio where they recorded and it. And then having that picture of the dude holding... <laughs> there were there was the no club. thought to any of that. Like, right. It's it's quite clear there was no thought. If Van Halen was before your time and you're not really familiar with them, check it out. You, you it's, it's, you know, musical literacy. Check out the first album, too. If you're our age or older... And you remember being inundated by Van Halen in the late 80s and early 90s? Skip it, because you already know what you think. <laughs> I mean, Summer Nights in 5150, though, I'd totally listen to again, sure. Get Up, I'd, you know, add for me. Um, <sighs> Get Up, uh, you know, lyrically. <laughs> I don't care about the, I never cared about the lyrics in a Van Halen song. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of, it's just kind of awkward, in the, I thought, you know. Mm. Anyway, that's it for 5150. Until next time, when we'll be reviewing Play Deep by the Outfield, another tribute episode. This is our tribute to vocalist and bassist Tony Lewis. Oh, man, mid-80s. It's mm. a big mid-80s thing. Are we going to do Kenny Loggins' uh, his Top Gun soundtrack next? I kind of like Kenny Loggins, so I hope not. Um, <laughs> but when you suggested doing the Outfield last week, I hadn't heard about Tony Lewis. Yeah. I thought you would just were just randomly saying, let's review the Outfield. I'm like, okay, sure. No, Co- no, no. A couple days reason. later, I found out. I'm like, okay, that's why you mentioned it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wouldn't just, uh, it, you know, I thought we had stuff planned for the rest of the year anyway. And uh, yeah, I wouldn't want to just change the schedule for no reason. Yeah, we can easily slip in a tribute album. A tribute yeah. episode, yeah. Until then, then, of course, next time. I don't know. Until then, of course, always remember ne- wherever you go in life, there you are. There you are. There you are.